Amen. You know, the world's a pretty big place when you think about it. But do you ever stop to consider why you live where you do in this world? I mean, why this state or that city or this neighborhood or your street for that matter? Most of us tend to think about where we live in terms of places that meet our needs. You know, good school systems, good community services, lower taxes, affordability, that sort of thing. But have you ever stopped to consider that perhaps God placed you where you live for a different reason altogether? Perhaps we live where we live not to have our needs met, but to meet the needs of the people around us. Jeremiah 29, 7 reads, Work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you. Seek the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Every Christ follower should be a gift to his or her neighborhood, and every church should be a gift to its city. God has placed us and our church in this part of his world for a purpose, to make an impact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our neighborhood as a church, and it's home to more than 600,000 names and faces, and over 50% of them report they have no connection to a church at all. That is every other person you meet. They are the reason we are here. Since the opening of our Kesslinger and Mill Creek campuses, our ability to love and serve our neighbors has grown immensely. Our Shepherd's Heart Care Center started out as just a closet of extra food, and now serves well over 1,000 people every month. Our Masterpiece Ministries reach and serve dozens of families of children with special needs in our community. We are increasingly becoming a church not for ourselves, but for our neighbors. And as we've grown, God has made it increasingly clear to us that our greatest impact is not going to happen by building bigger and bigger facilities at any one campus. We believe we must reproduce ourselves by strategically placing campuses in the communities we're already poised to reach. We are convinced that God is leading us toward becoming a family of neighborhood churches committed to transforming lives and impacting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This neighborhood church vision is to strategically expand and multiply our gospel impact through establishing neighborhood churches. It means we must also intentionally develop new leaders in all areas of ministry. We've already begun this through our Leadership Institute and expanding it through our pastoral residency program. It means developing new opportunities keeping our eyes open for communities in need and cultivating hearts of compassion that can see the opportunities emerging for gospel impact. Ministries like our Shepherd's Heart Care Center, Masterpiece Ministry, Support and Care Ministries have been reaching the unique needs of our neighbors and we are only just beginning. More importantly, it means more people transformed by the gospel, experiencing grace, growing in faith, and making an impact right where they are. It means people like you. You see, we cannot do this without you. You are the gospel agent in your home. You are the chapel on your street and in your neighborhood. There are 300,000 people right around us who do not know the hope of the gospel. What could God do if everyone watching this committed to loving and serving their neighbors? This is what the Neighborhood Church vision is all about. It's about the gospel, the church, the neighborhood, and you. I don't know about you, but that little video that I've seen multiple times um, always makes me excited and proud and, uh, and glad to be part of a church family that is making that kind of impact and making a growing impact right here in our county and our region where we live. So I hope it does that same thing for you too. Well, from the time I was in uh, fourth grade, middle of fourth grade until I graduated from high school, uh, my family lived in a small town about 40 miles north of New York City. The town was called Armonk, and even though it was a small town, it was um, located in Westchester County, which at that time was one of the more affluent counties in the entire country. So growing up, I was largely unaware uh, that many of my friends' families were actually wealthier than I can even imagine. And my brother, uh, who's younger than me, uh, tells a story to this day about when and how he realized this was true. And I've told this story before. You might remember it, but it fits our topic today. But one summer weekend... A family that was brand new to our church uh, invited our family to go spend a day with them on their boat uh, that was anchored in Long Island Sound. I was away at camp or something, so I wasn't actually there that day. My brother tells the story. 
But this family happened to own a small yacht, a 40 or 50 footer that they kept on Long Island Sound outside New York City. And the boat itself was just wildly impressive to my brother who was about 11 years old at the time. And when lunch came around, uh, the lady whose family owned the yacht brought lunch, and only she didn't bring like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or hot dogs like we would think. She brought uh, this big fancy deli tray uh, filled with rolled up fancy meats with toothpicks stuck in them. And for some reason, to his 11-year-old mind, this was like the, the pinnacle of opulent living. <laughs> the little fancy rolled up meats with the, with the toothpicks. And then just as they were enjoying lunch, uh, just when he thought life could not possibly get any better, a much bigger yacht, like a 150-footer, came floating by. And just then the lady who owned the 40-foot yacht looked up and kind of looked over her shoulder and went, eh, that's how the other half lives. <laughs> and my brother said it slowly dawned on his 11-year-old mind that if that was the other half, our family didn't leave in either half. I think most of us have had an experience like that, maybe not on a yacht, or maybe, but maybe driving through a certain neighborhood, or maybe reading about a movie star that lives in a 30,000-foot house. Uh, I just saw that Michael Jordan uh, put a, uh, his house up for sale in Lake Forest, uh, 52,000 square feet. Yeah, that's, that, that's, a lot of, that's bigger than this whole campus, all right? That's a lot of square feet. Or maybe we're tempted to think like my brother thought, at least at times. We all want to be in that other half. Now today we continue our series from the book of songs called the songs book of psalms called songs of the soul. I've always had trouble saying those words back to back. And so far we've seen that the psalms are these ancient songs and prayers that express a full range of human experience and emotions. And in that way they're very contemporary even though they're ancient because we too in our lives experience these same things and these same emotions. We've seen psalms of praise and worship, psalms of, of lament. These are psalms of sorrow and pain. We've seen psalms of confession. And last week we saw a psalm of stillness in the midst of a raging storm. Now today we look at a psalm that talks about, in a way, the other half. Talks about envy and bitterness and confession and worship. It's Psalm 73. I'm going to read part of the psalm for you, then we're going to go back and work our way through it. Psalm 73, and your Bible will say that it's a psalm of Asaph. Now, Asaph is thought to have been one of the lead music and choir directors of the time. He served under both King David and King Solomon. Uh, Twelve of the 150 psalms are ascribed to Asaph's name. He begins like this. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So Asaph, Asaph begins with what he knows to be true about God. God is good. He has a special relationship with those who honor him and worship him and obey him, the pure in heart. Now notice how quickly his tone changes. Verse 2. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. I'm going to stop there and tell you that the first whole part of this psalm could simply be called no fair. That's point one today. No fair. Now anyone who's raised children recognizes immediately the no fair stage of childhood because kids very quickly become very concerned about fairness. Isn't that right? Sibling gets a different toy at a McDonald's Happy Meal. No fair. You got the dinosaur. 
or a child looks at his ice cream for dessert and says, no fair, his, his scoops are bigger than mine. Or at bedtime, one has to go to bed before the other because he's younger. No fair, he gets to stay up later than me. But it's not just children who think no fair, is it? I was at an orientation retreat with our Chapel Street summer interns last summer in, at Lake Geneva. And we took one of those lake tours where they take you on a boat and you kind of cruise along the shoreline. And the, the, the tour director describes all these fabulous mansions along the coast of Lake Geneva. And I remember one of them in particular. Uh, I tried to look it up. I couldn't find information. But this, this, the, the guide said one of the estates at one time was owned by a man who was not only fabulously wealthy, but liked to throw extravagant birthday parties for himself. And on the occasion of his 65th birthday, he purchased 65 brand new Corvette automobiles and lined them up in an array on, on, on the, the estate. And then as his guests arrived, there were something like 500 guests, each guest got a key. And the game was, at one point, he had everybody go out and they could try their key in the cars. And if the car started up, you drove it home. Think about that. Okay, a birthday party with, with 65 Corvettes' party favors. No fair. Not fair. Speaking of cars, have you heard about the Sultan of Brunei? Okay. Sultan of Brunei's name is Hassan al Bolkaya. He's 73 years old, assumed the throne when his father abdicated in 1967. So he's been sultan for 50 years, over 50 years. I wonder what his business card says, just like sultan, right? He's thought to be the richest monarch in the world with a net worth of over $20 billion and growing. His income comes mostly from oil. And get this, his personal wealth increases at the rate of $100 a second. Now, does that sound fair to you? He lives in a palace that has 2 million square feet of floor space, over 1,700 rooms, and 257 bathrooms. That means he could use one bathroom a day. And he wouldn't have to use one twice until he got to the middle of September. Think about that. He once had a collection of 7,000 cars which included over 600 Rolls-Royce automobiles, including one that was completely plated in 24 karat gold. I'm not making this up. This is the car. That single car worth $14 million. Okay, say it with me. No fair, right? Asaph begins, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. I know God is good. I've been taught that all my life. But I started to lose my footing. I started to doubt what I knew to be true about God. Verse 3, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now this is both a confession and a complaint. The confession is, I was envious. Now envy is the subject of the tenth of the Ten Commandments, which I'm sure you know. You shall not covet, that simply means uh, to be envious of. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not, shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything else that is your neighbor's. That's Exodus 20, the tenth of the Ten Commandments. Now, we all know what envy is. We all know what it is. It's simply wanting what you don't have. Specifically, wanting something that belongs to somebody else. Now, throughout Christian history, envy has been considered one of the seven deadly sins. You can probably recite these as well. Pride, greed, lust, gluttony, wrath, sloth, envy. Now, why is envy sinful? It's just wanting something. It's wanting something you don't have. Why is it sinful? Envy is sinful because it's like a poison that creates resentment and bitterness of heart. Proverbs 14, 30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Envy is sinful because it robs us of gratitude. You can't experience gratitude when you're envying something that you don't have. Envy is sinful because it robs us of joy. Envy is sinful ultimately because it robs us of worship and praise. Asaph is confessing that he has slipped into envy. We'll come back to that later. Now, the complaint is, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. 
It's as if Asaph has been watching some ancient version of lifestyles of the rich and famous or reading about the Sultan of Brunei. And he cries out, no fair. It just doesn't seem fair or right. And skipping down to verse 13, we see another complaint. Verse 13 says, all in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence for all the day long I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. Now the second complaint is this. I've been good. I've obeyed you, God. And it hasn't paid off for me. My faith isn't working. It's not fair. You've not been fair with me. Now Asaph is voicing two bitter questions that we still have today. Why do the wicked, that word means faithless or foolish, why do the wicked prosper? And the flip side of that is why do the righteous, the faithful, suffer or struggle? Is God paying attention to any of this? It's just not fair. Now, listen how he describes the prosperity of the wicked. Verse 3, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. I was envious of their prosperity. But more than that, look at them. Just look, just look. They're healthy. They have no no pain until they die, and, and their bodies are fat and sleek. Now, that sounds like an insult to us, but it's not. It means they have enough food, they have more than enough food, and they're beautiful. Verse 5, they, do not, they are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Notice the word they. They, you know them, those, those rich sinners... They don't have the same problems that the rest of us have. They don't worry about paying their bills. They don't have car problems. In fact, all 7,000 of their cars are new, right? They don't worry about how they're going to send their kids to college. They just buy the college. They don't worry about how they're going to retire. They don't have the same problems. Verse 6, therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their prosperity makes them proud. And they can do whatever they want and get away with it. In verse 7, My favorite. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. You can just hear the bitterness flowing out of Asaph's heart. Their eyes swell out through fatness. That's an expression in the Hebrew that basically means something like, these rich and arrogant fat cats stuff their faces with more food than they can ever eat, and everything about them just reeks of wealth and privilege. And he's not even done yet. Verse 8, they scoff with... They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore people, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there any knowledge in the Most High? Now this is an even more serious accusation. Not only are they rich, not only are they gluttonous, not only are they proud, but they mock God himself. He doesn't know. How can he know? We can do anything we want. Verse 12, behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. Asaph is saying, I've always believed in you, God. I've always believed that you were good. But I look around me and I see things that just don't make any sense to me. Things that that just seem wrong. Now, we need to see several things here at this point. First, notice the extraordinary honesty of Asaph before God. Now up to this point, this is, not, this is not easy to read. This is not coming from a good place in his heart, but he's honest with God. There's a confession here. Confession of sin, the sin of envy. But there's also the confession of doubt. My feet almost slipped. I find myself doubting who you are and your character. Do you know that in prayer we can confess more than sin to God? We can confess sin, but more than that, we can confess doubt and questions and frustration and anger. We can come to God in prayer and shout, for example, no fair. All relationship with God begins with honesty. Asaph's honest. But there's something else here, too. Embedded in his confession is a faulty understanding of both God and faith. Asaph is admitting that he had slipped into this kind of thinking. You know, if I'm good and I obey God, then God should reward me with material prosperity. Now, this is just an ancient version of what we would call today the prosperity gospel. It's still preached today that somehow people believe that God promises financial and material wealth to those who put their faith in him. So if you're good, he pays you back. 
The assumption is that God is obligated to reward us for good behavior. That God is obligated to be fair. God is obligated to give me the same thing he gives everybody else. What you need to see is that this is not faith. This is essentially the Hindu doctrine of karma and is foreign to biblical faith. In fact, the Bible has a whole book, 40-some chapters devoted to the unfairness of life. It's called the book of Job. And over and over again, we are taught in Scripture that life on this side of eternity is fundamentally unfair. Even Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Thirdly, Asaph also misidentifies the blessing of God. So far in the psalm, he's completely identified God's blessing with material wealth and prosperity. It's not so. And finally, Asaph badly misjudges the character of God, suggesting that perhaps God is not good because he's unfair with the distribution of resources, the distribution of wealth. So Asaph begins his psalm by crying out to God, no fair. And then he moves into the second part of the psalm that I'm calling the presence of God. The presence of God. Have you ever seen one of those images that at first looks like one thing and the longer you look at it, it looks like another thing? Take a look at this one. How many of you see an old woman with a big nose? How many of you see a young woman looking the other way? Okay, all depends how you look at it. How about this one? How many of you see a duck? How many of you see a rabbit? Okay. I looked at this for like five minutes, and I could not see the other thing. I saw a duck. I couldn't see the other thing. And I had to like look up. What else is here? Oh, a duck. Duh. You know, I mean a rabbit. I can see it. It all depends on perspective. Look at Psalm, 16, Psalm 73, verse 16. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. I looked at the world, saw things I couldn't understand. I saw how the wicked, how the foolish, how the godless people around me were prospering. I began to envy their prosperity. My feet almost slipped. I began to doubt your goodness. And then I went into the sanctuary. Now, what does Asaph mean by sanctuary? The sanctuary refers to the holy place, the sacred place, the place of, wor of worship for the ancient people of Israel would have been the tabernacle where God's presence dwelled with his people. So Asaph is saying, <coughs> excuse me, that I went into the presence of God, I put myself in position to hear the word of God, then I remembered God's truth. Then I remembered God's promises. And when he went into the sanctuary, he saw things differently. He saw from a different perspective. He says, then I discerned their end. Verse 18, truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. He takes a completely different perspective. He takes on... God's perspective, an eternal perspective. A pastor and writer named Paul David Tripp writes, Asaph's psalm begins without a sense of eternal destiny. You see, without eternity, Asaph was right. If this present physical world is all we have, then all, all, then all life is about what you can experience, acquire, and enjoy in the here and now. And if this life is all there is, then you would expect a good God to bless those who follow him right here, right now, and curse those who mock him right here, right now. But this is not all there is. From day one, the world has always been marching toward a destination. The only way to understand life is to understand that the world you are now living in is not meant to be a destination, but a place of preparation for a final destination. So when Asaph goes into the sanctuary, into the presence of God, he understands that ultimately the wicked will not prosper. Rather, they will face judgment because God will judge all sin with absolute righteousness. But notice also, he sees himself more clearly. Verse 21, When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and arrogant. I was like a beast toward you. So he not only admits and confesses his sin, the sin of envy, he sees what envy has created in his heart. It's created the kind of bitter resentment in his life. 
not only toward the prosperous wicked, notice, but also toward God himself. That's why envy robs us of worship and praise. He acknowledges his sin and repents. I was like a brute beast before you. I think the translation from Hebrew is, I was such a knucklehead before you. And that leads us to the last part of the psalm, which I'm calling the goodness of God. Verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. So Asaph returns to and affirms three truths. First, God is with him. I am continually with you, and you hold my right hand. The images of a loving father holding the hand of his child. It's an intimate relationship. It's an intimate presence. Secondly, God guides him. You guide me with your counsel. God's word, God's truth corrects his faulty vision, and God confronts his envy and then redirects his heart. And thirdly, God promises glory. You will receive me to glory. This is the eternal perspective, the promise of heaven itself. Therefore, he says, there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. There is nothing I can desire. Prosperity, health, wealth, 7,000 cars. Nothing I, found, I, nothing I found myself in being before can compare to what I already have in you. Then verse 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far off from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, but for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of all your good works. So Asaph ends like he begins. God is good, and it is good to be near God. In the middle of the psalm, Asaph temporarily forgets God's goodness because he was looking for goodness somewhere else. Again, Paul David Tripp writes, all the good we are looking for can only be found in one place, God. God is good in every possible way. He is good in righteousness. He is good in power. He is good in grace. He is good in his faithfulness. He is good in mercy. He is good in holiness. He is good in justice. He is good in his rule. All his words are good and true, and his promises are are good. And this good God is, Asaph says, the strength of our hearts and our portion forever. It is good to be with him. <clears throat> I don't know if you're like me. Um, you may have watched some this past week. I think it was on Monday. I watched some of the replays of it, but it was the, 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 the huge memorial service that was celebrated in Los Angeles for Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and the others who died in the helicopter crash a month or so ago. 20,000 people gathered in a huge arena to pay their respects. And it was, it was quite moving in some ways, but the first speaker was a television personality named Jimmy Kimmel. I know nothing about Jimmy Kimmel. I don't know about his faith. He referred to the Catholic Church a couple times. But in his opening comments, during which he was very emotional, just about five minutes long, he said, among other things, he said, I've been trying to make sense of what happened, trying to find something positive to take away from this. The best I could come up with is gratitude, he said. And at that point I thought, yeah, that, that's a good thing to say. Gratitude for a life lived, for relationships, for love. And then he continued and he said, we can be grateful for the time we had with them and the time we have with each other. And that's all, he said. And I wanted to scream out, no, no, that's not all. That's not all there is. Life is good. Life matters. Our relationships now matter. But this is not all there is. Please don't say it that way. This life is not the final destination. All the fame and fortune, all the houses, all the cars, all the wealth, all the prosperity in the world can't begin to compare with the glory that God promises. 
It's what Paul talked about in Romans chapter 8. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Because he is the strength of our hearts. He is our portion, not just now, but forever, the psalm says. So may we be people who live not just for the now, not just for this horizon we can see, as important as that is, but maybe be, maybe be those who long for the, for the distant horizon, for the eternal horizon, people who long not just to be in the other half, but may we be people who, who are in the sanctuary. May we be people of the sanctuary. May we be people who proclaim, He is our portion forever. Will you bow with me as we close and prepare our hearts for the table of the Lord? Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this ancient, yet such, such a contemporary cry of an honest heart. We live in a world that does seem so unfair so often. And sometimes we, we struggle when that unfairness hits close to home. We struggle to hold on to your eternal perspective. And so today, by your word, remind us that it is you who hold on to us. And as we come to your table, remind us that your blessings, your promises go far beyond wealth and houses and cars. Remind us through bread and cup that you are our strength and portion. Forgive us when we forget that. Remind us today that it is good to be near to you. It's in your name that we pray.